Dan and I live on customer sites, right? We work for Microsoft. We're field engineers. So we go to your sites, and that's our bread and butter. Now, as we're going to your sites out there, what's happened is we start seeing a lot of noise about DevOps. Possibly every customer we're going to, the <coughs> management have been sold DevOps, and the staff have been told that they're going to be doing that. And in fact, I know one of the customers out there has been had their job title renamed to be DevOps, and that person's got no idea what that actually means. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that yeah, one. yeah. Absolutely. And, and we're seeing that, you know, we, we visit a lot of customers now, and, and I'm, I come from a developer background, but I'm visiting more and more infrastructure teams. And uh, yeah, we just thought we'd, we'd, we'd do one from the, from the IT pros perspective. But, I mean, some of you would have been to two or three DevOps talks. Did anyone go to Donovan's Zero to DevOps? Yesterday? Yeah, amazing. So we're going to do a similar thing today, but we'll, we'll take it from a slightly different perspective. And Neil, Pe Neil Peterson stuff? Who's been to his sessions? Great sessions. Oh, that's good, because the demos we're doing kind of repeat a little bit what he said, so that's really quite handy. All right, so that's where we're coming from. Now, what we've done is DevOps is about a journey. That's my way of looking at it, right? Yeah. And so part of, a fair whack of the content yeah. of this is the journey that I've gone through. And we've put in the tools that you guys are going to have to learn as IT pros to get into this space. All right. Oh, start the timer. All right, groovy. So, first things first. When Dan and I came together, we had a lot of discussions about this stuff. And we tried to just articulate out where each side of the fence was. And really, there is a fence between the two in the current slash old school way of thinking about things. And so for IT pros, I just went and listed out a bunch of reasons about a bunch of um, bit of feedback from you guys, because we, we canvassed you guys, we got some feedback, we put the reasons in, and we called them out. Right? And it, it's kind of standard stuff, we're not going to talk to each point, but the general gist is that as IT pros, you're doing all this stuff, and there's a lot of stuff to do. There's more stuff than you can possibly do. And so... If we cut to the chase a little bit, it's really hard to build the stuff and build it fast enough and patch the stuff and keep it compliant for security and all of that stuff. Right? And so, if we're honest between us, there's a little bit of a, little bit of a perception that, that IT pros are being seen as a bit of a blocker. Which we're just not fast enough. Even if you work 80 to 100 hours a week, you still couldn't get through your backlog. All right? So that's kind of where we're at at the minute. From a development side, very similar. You know, all teams I see are really busy. You know, I think there's very few, or any of us really, who have got a lot of spare time on their hands. Right? We're all working really, really hard, keeping the wheels on, you know, delivering software and delivering value. And I think, uh, you know, we, we often are looking. The question I get a lot is, how can we? Why? If, why do things take so long? You know, how can we speed things up? Uh, and and you know. Six weeks to provision a VM. Sometimes, you know, those sort of that time to provision is, is not uncommon um, from from some of the sites we see. Clearly, there's there's no single team I don't think that you could blame for that. I think that's more about you know changing the culture and getting more to moving things faster. And imagine what could happen if we could if we could get that time to provision right down. And I think DevOps culture is a lot about that, and that's one of the one of the key things we want to talk about today. So when we go to sites, we you know, we visit a lot of customers, so you know, I can see quite a few, few friends and, and people that I've met uh, in the room from, from different customers. And, and you know, sometimes, not to be too much of a downer, but sometimes we see you know, siloed teams, I think, is a really good example, where you see you've got a development and test organization, and then you've got your infrastructure organization. They can be quite separate. They can look like two different organizations sometimes. And what you really want to do with the DevOps culture, of course, is, is get those teams closer together. Um, from the dev side, not all developers are the best at understanding compliance, you know, really going deep on ISO or on PCI DSS, and sometimes we really want to bring them along the, on the journey for that. So I think, personally think that's a, that's a way that the, the dev side of, of the equation can improve. And those are the sort of hallmarks we see um, when we see organisations, I think, are either ready to start that, that DevOps journey or, or should be looking at it very seriously. Yeah, exactly. So, so pretty much nothing's going to change if nothing changes. So management have been sold this DevOps thing, they want to do stuff differently, and they're looking towards what this movement is. Mm. So what is DevOps? Any, any ideas, Ken? Lots. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get 
this question, I get this question, you know, every team that I visit, what is DevOps? And, and the, the problem is, it's become a bit of a buzzword, right? I mean, you know, it's become a marketing term, it's a product, some vendors will try and sell you DevOps, will sell you a tool that does all the DevOps. And, you know, if you've been to Donovan's talk, where you saw the keynote, you know, he, he talks about uh, DevOps being the union of, of people, uh, process, and products to, to deliver value to, to our end users. And I think that's a really, really good uh, description. But there's another key thing for me, a really good hallmark of, of DevOps. Next slide. It's when these three teams or these three hats or these three practices, whatever you want to call it, uh, come together and start working together. You know, when I see developers and engineers and testers along with, with uh, infrastructure people and security and compliance, uh, all sitting around the same pod or sitting around the same table just to sort, you know, just to figure out a problem or find a solution and which is generally aligned with making the organization more successful or delivering value to customers and users, then to me, that's the sign of a really good looking DevOps culture and I think that's a good thing to, to aim for. That, that little segment in the middle of that Venn diagram, that's the sweet spot, right? That's, uh, that's the DevOps culture right there. That's what you want to see in terms of, of what does DevOps look like. There's you know, lots of answers to that question. I think the question really, should come from you and your organisation, but I think, yeah, you know, getting that, that teamwork and that collaboration, I think, is, is what I think of when someone asks me uh, that question. And that leads nicely into the next slide. Oh, good stuff, yeah. So yeah. collaboration and communication drives efficiency. So from your side, what are you, what are you seeing in terms of that? So what we did was I put my spin on this, because I can only really speak to myself, and generically represent you guys as well. When we start rolling out stuff, or implementing stuff, or putting change in place, I want to cover off, I want to bring my concerns to the table. And so my concerns are the ones in orange. Um, I want to know there's monitoring in place. So when we put this thing into prod, or dev, test, UAT, whatever it is, we have some metrics which can measure what the thing's looking like and how well it's working. And then we can take the metrics and do something with it. Because we want to have sort of some loop, some automatic loop going on. We need to get on that path. Uh, which leads into the fact we want automation as well. Not only do we want to stand it up quickly, we will automatically want to scale up or scale out. So those are my two things. And I want documentation as well. Um, I've still been on sites recently where we have to do as build documentation. And I'm looking at the client over there because he's in the room. <laughs> and, these are, and these are these big war and peace things that we write, write once and then we put into a directory. We probably never look at them again. Now, I, I don't want to do that stuff anymore. That yeah. stuff sucks. I want to have this thing to be self-documenting so that with some basic understanding of the syntax and things, Dan can come along straight after, a couple of months later, and understand what I've tried to achieve. Yeah, great. Have achieved, not tried to achieve. Yeah. And, fr and from a development side, you know, I'm really interested in design and, and quality and, and speed, you know, speed to market, or how quickly can we get that value in front of, in front of users and customers. So what we really want to do is bring those, those two concepts together um, because I think there's a little bit of that in everything. Um, when we start talking about these at the same table. For, for example, you know, I think there's, there's a little bit of design, a little bit of beauty in how you, you design your network or how you architect your network. You know, uh, talking with great network engineers, how they sort out their subnets and all that sort of thing, I think there's a bit of, bit of design in that. And of course, you know, there's, there's quality. We're all interested in quality. It's not to say one side's more interested than the other. But when we get around the same table and we talk to these things, then we should, then hopefully we're working towards that goal, which of course is delivering value to our users and, and our customers. Really quickly on continuous delivery, a lot of what we're talking about today is out of a book called Continuous Delivery by Jez Humble and Mr. Farley. Um, and it's a wonderful book, it's a bit of a tome, but it, it talks to a, a set of pat patterns and practices which include DevOps. Jez Humble, of course, being, I guess, acknowledged as the father of DevOps. And you know there are processes in continuous delivery, like infrastructure as code, like release management, that, that are key to that process. So we just wanted to call that out, that uh, that's where I think the, a lot of these practices come from, is, is, that, is that book and that movement. And with that, we're done with the fluffy we're here. part. We're here, fantastic. Yeah, cool. So we call that the fluffy part of the presentation. From now, going forward, the diagrams are gonna be hand-drawn, uh, mainly because it's really cool fun to do that on your Surface Book or Windows Inc. It's, it's really cool. We sat down for hours drawing the stuff. And instead of doing more boxes and PowerPoint, we thought, you know what? We'll just put them up on the screen. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do the arrow thing and I yeah. the points? Yeah, good idea. Okay, so DevOps is a journey. Um, 
obviously, you can't just do DevOps overnight, um, as I'm sure you've realized by now. Uh, that there's a journey, right? With any journey, you need a roadmap, and this is, I think, a way that I like drawing the roadmap. This borrows heavily from, from the continuous delivery book. There's a maturity model in that, in that book. And this is just drawn a different way. Up in the top right-hand corner, that's your goal. The arrow is, is the path that you're gonna take, and these, these uh, blue Xs are the milestones along the way. Each one of those milestones is, is a safe landing point. You know, even if you stopped at, at, at number three, automated deployment, that would bring massive value to your organization. So we really like breaking this down into small chunks. Improvement Carter, if you will, and, and laying it out like this. Now, this is not the same for every organization, but think in the top right corner, what is your goal? You know, that might be getting to Azure, you know, migrating or moving into Azure, which we see a lot, or it could be DevOps culture, or it could be continuous delivery. That's top right. Build your roadmap along the way, and we've, we've given some examples of what we think are pretty good places to start. Where would you start, Kat, if you were starting the DevOps journey again now? Where would you start? Source control. Absolutely. Every time. Yep. Um, I'm thinking of the same customer with the as-build document, but it's, it's a case of you've got scripts, you've got artifacts, you've got databases, I think you were saying, for one of your clients. Yes. You want to take that stuff and check it in somewhere that you can keep a track of it. You know? This doesn't have to be complicated. You can use TFS, you can use Git, you can use whatever technology you want, but you want to get this stuff and check it into a place so that you can make sure you've got it in a central place, there's not lots of dot old versions of scripts lying around the show, and then you can keep track of stuff, and you can press the blame button and see who changed what. So I would start with source control. Fantastic, continuous integration, it's a, it's a great practice. We can, it, it ticks some compliance boxes as well, auditing, it's evidence, a uh, good source control system will give you, will use a cryptographic technique to make sure that you know exactly who made that change, when they changed it, and uh, exactly what was changed. So that's a really good practice. If we move up, the, move up the roadmap a little bit, let's talk about infrastructure as code. So infrastructure as code, we're talking DSC um, templates, that sort of thing? Yeah, and that's the thing that really got into my head that I needed to think about differently. It's like a paradigm change or an ethos change. No longer are you going to be click next technicians. You know, if you're in that space, you're going to be the hardware guy one day sitting in the corner. Really, you've got to start thinking about everything you do on your fleet has been code. And, and for an IT pro, that's kind of terrifying because my scripting ability is pretty much limited to cut and paste from Bing. So we need to think in terms of code and we need to get our skills up to a level that we can understand the code that we're taking as well. Because there's tons of stuff out there. You, know, you don't have to start from scratch, but you need to piece it together intelligently and understand it. So infrastructure as a code for me was a massive thing. Yeah. We're going to de demonstrate quite a bit of that today. And finally, right at the top there, automated, uh, sorry, just before that is, is monitoring. And I think um, we're going to talk about monitoring quite a bit um, later on, but I think there's, there's real value in teams, and often that's quite a good place to start as well in terms of getting that, those really important metrics and, and performance. And yeah, I think and Rick, like uh, Rick showed it this morning, yeah. I think one of the first sessions, and he took the feedback and he fed it back in, and then he started scaling out in reaction to the feedback he got. Mm -hmm. So as is, I think it was 1.5 seconds for a thing happened, he built some more machines out. When the, the number of transactions got down and the times were down, he scaled them back down again. You did it with containers, actually. Very cool. It was really cool. So I think we need to get that set up so that we can do that. Now, we're not doing that as part of this demo, mm -hmm. um, purely because we had to keep a tight focus on things. Oh, but I think you need to set it up so you can do that yeah, going right. forward. Cool. And look, we're just calling out a few tools as well. Obviously, Visual Studio Team Services, that's what we're going to do our demonstration in today, uh, which, which covers a lot of these practices. Uh, operations Management Suite, we have a quick look at that? Yes. Yeah, great. And Windows Server 2016, which is a very exciting release, uh, just, just gone into GA, and we're, go we're going to choose that for our, our demo as well. So those are the tools we think are, are relating uh, to this roadmap. <coughs> okay, so when we're thinking about our demo, we really wanted to make this feel a little bit like Dev and Ops. Uh, you know, when Dev met Ops, and I've got an application, well, we've got an application that we want to deploy. And it's a ticketing application, very simple. It's got an API. Yep. So the API is written in ASP.NET. Uh, it's a web API project, and we're going to deploy that uh, into a Windows Server core container. And the web front end talks to the API, and that's going to be deployed in a nano server container because it's running Node.js. Now, what do you know about configuring Node.js in a server environment here? Okay. Um. 
<laughs> Not much. Slim to none? Not much. Cool. So what we thought we would do is we would actually use the container. So the container, of course, is, you know, Docker containers. These have just landed on Windows Server 2016. This is in GA now. And we're going to, because I know how to set up a, a node web server, I'm going to do that inside the container. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to package that up, or, and where our, our process is going to package that up. And then, Cam, how about you just plug in the, the services that we need, all right? So I need a, a bit of power, that's right, and uh, some networking. Yep. And also some storage. So I'd really like a, a SQL database. So why don't we do that in Azure, Se Azure SQL DB? Perfect. Cool. But notice all of this is running on Windows Server 2016. Now, of course, we're going to do our VM in Azure. But this, uh, most of this will, will run on, on premises. Most of the demo that we're going to show will and run on, on premises yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and that was kind of the barrier we had between the two. Dan came up with those requirements, and then it was over to me to try and figure out a way to deliver that stuff. And that's the, the barrier. That's not the barrier. That's how the roles were defined when we did this. We started off being developer, and we started off being IT pro. But as we go forward, those boundaries are going to blur a whole bunch, I think. And, and we realised that you know, going into the presentation, we, we thought we could have those roles defined, but coming out of it, you know what? The world's changing. I'm going to be going more in his world, and he's going to come a little bit into our world. Good point. So we decided we want to use uh, Azure-based, because it's easier to demo. You can stand the whole thing up. So we're going to use Azure, which is really cool. We want to use ARM, which is Azure Resource Manager Templates. And we want to use that to build the thing. And the reason for that is because it seems to be popping up everywhere. It's a nice way to um, stand up your infrastructure as code. So that's nice and tidy. ARM templates seem to, seem to be a good thing. Once we've built the environment, we then got to go through and configure it. And it's not just about standing up stuff. You want to make it not work, but sing. And to make stuff sing, you use DSC. And I think of DSC as an automated build-to-run checklist. So that's those little extra bits you used to do by hand. Cool. So that's cool. Build that's it with ARM, configure with DSC. PowerShell, of course, manages everything. It's kind of ubiquitous by now. We're not going to dwell on that too much. If you haven't got PowerShell skills, you're in trouble though. And monitoring, we decided to use OMS, and we wanted to use it for uh, platform as a service SQL monitoring. We wanted to keep track of our uh, change, uh, the patches that are required on the box, and just keep track of the logs and things. And then about a week and a half or two weeks ago, we released Azure Monitor, so that turned up. So we thought we'll, we'll chuck that in the mix as well. So we're going to use Azure Monitor for the base monitoring, you know, CPU, memory, disk, and all that kind of traditional stuff. And we're going to use OMS for the niche monitoring over and above that. Cool. Let's do it. Oh, I'm doing a demo, aren't I? Yeah. All right. Here we go. So this is how I started. This is where it gets a bit freaky for me. Now you can all see that. Awesome. So when I started talking to Dan about this stuff, I realized pretty quick I was going to have to start playing with Visual Studio. And I've got to be honest, I haven't done a lot of time in Visual Studio. In fact, when I went to their website, went to visualstudio.com, I thought I'll download Visual Studio, and there's like five or six flavors of the thing. It's just ridiculous. So I downloaded Community, started to keep it simple. Now, there is a caveat for licensing and things, isn't oh, it? It's fine. I mean, most of you in this room, I suspect, are either MSDN subscribers or Visual Studio subscribers. Um, if you're not, then, yeah, you can use community to play around and uh, it's, you know, it's fine for trials and, yeah. and training and things like that. But, yeah, most of you would be subscribers and therefore you can either install the, the full product, either Pro or Enterprise, or you could just spin up the VM. So, like Donovan said, there's a, a great Visual Studio VM in Azure which you can use your free Azure credits to spin up and that's a fully loaded VM environment just sitting there ready to go. Run it as a DS2 or a DS3 and then, you, you know, you, you're basically where where Callum is right now. It's an installed version of Visual Studio. That's really convenient. Awesome. So I talked to Dan. So Dan is my DevOps mentor. Oh, that's a tip, by the way. As you go through your DevOps journey, all of you, IT pro or not, I think you need to get yourself a mentor. That would be my biggest tip of the day. It's in, when, I, when we did this project, I didn't realize the learning curve and the time span I had. It's not one of these gentle things. It's a bit like that for the learning curve. So you need someone to guide you through things a little bit. So he let me play, and then he be gently corrected me onto the right path in a very nice way. I think you've been quite humble there. <laughs> I appreciate it. So what we're doing, we're going to go into Visual Studio, and we're going to create a new project. Now, Neil Peterson showed this the other day. All I wanted to do 
was after you read a couple of books and you read the papers and things, you kind of want to get your hands dirty. So we're just simply going to create an Azure resource group. We're going to keep it nice and simple. Once we've got into the beast, once we've got into that part, we get a screen pop up and it's got all these options that we can choose from. Now, I don't actually care particularly what I choose. I just want to get my hands dirty. So I like the idea of VMs and a load balancer because I figure there's a fair chance someone's going to ask me to deliver that one day. Yeah. So this is Azure Resource Group uh, template. It's in Visual Studio if you install the Azure SDK. And you just need a, a fairly recent version of this. And I just discovered this a few weeks ago, and it's yeah, mm. fantastic. It's something we discovered uh, two days ago, I think it was, for me anyway, was this JSON outline here. So that's really quite handy. And Neil demoed it yesterday. Um, surprise. Visual Studio is an awesome beast, but it's a big thing. So, oh, now I need to zoom that. Groovy. So we've got and created this thing. A couple of main files get created, right? We're going to do a bit of a whistle stop to it because there's a whole hour session you can listen to if you need to. But you've got your parameters file, and there you'll pre populated answers. So you've got a script coming up you're going to see in a second. But the parameters file just goes and puts some answers in. And as you supply stuff into the script, you can save it in there and pass it back. So it's just a nice way of making your testing easy with pre-populated answers. But the main beast of all of this is your template file. Is it easy? Now, this is the beast that does all the work for you. It's kind of obvious, some parts of it, the first two parts. You've got variables. We're just to you know, declare once and use them all throughout the script kind of stuff. No great shakes there. We've got a whole bunch of stuff. You start putting in image names and network information and all of that. Dead simple, not going to talk about it. You've got parameters. That's the stuff that gets passed into the script. Again, dead simple, we're not going to talk about it particularly. When you run this thing, you get prompted for that information. If you choose to save it, it saves it off into that parameters file on the side over here. So that's all cool, nice and easy. In the resources up here, this is where all the information starts. This is where the work really starts happening. You've got some stuff that gets created that you need to have as part of your Azure resource group creation, and that's those bits up there. For those of you that don't know, an Azure resource group is just basically a collection of stuff inside Azure. All right? you, we, when I stand, stand up a sandpit, I create a resource group, and I put my server and my database and all sorts of junk in there. So I just think of it as a bit of a collection. As I go through and I develop my code, I stand up another one and another one and another one, I just rip them down. As you get a bit more mature, you can then just go and do deltas on existing ones. But for testing purposes, I kept it simple. The main bits here, for this particular one here, is the load balancer. Now, for the most part, I cut and paste from Azure quick start templates when I was playing with stuff. That's how I got onto this thing, right? Got the template from this, so I did this, and then I wanted to put more functionality in, so I just went and found stuff off the internet, which is really, really cool. It's a nice, easy way to do stuff. And there's a huge library, isn't there? Oh, it's huge, yeah. I was just going to, I think I opened it. I've set up SSL offloading load oh, no, balancers, you know, um, VM, VM farms for um, web servers, you name it. Uh, there's a lot of PaaS stuff as well, so, you know, for websites plus, plus SQL servers, um, Pretty much, if it's been done, someone's checked in a, a version of this code that you can go and use. It's very cool. Mm, it's very, very neat stuff. And of course, the benefit of this is you can go and get the code, stand up your environment, have a play, and rip it down again. Just be careful if you leave it running all the time, you'll pay for it. If you want to keep on top of your costs, just rip it down afterwards. Groovy. Cool. So. Thank you, Camp. That's the that's the ARM templates, and of course, in that scenario, you could right-click deploy out of the project, couldn't you? And just um, oh, deploy I've got that straight that, later. I? Yes, right. <laughs> minor point. That's the that's the right-click deploy scenario, right? Very uncool in DevOps. The hipsters will kill you if you do that. But it's a, it's a good way to test those environments and actually, um, you know, see if your ARM templates are working really quickly. What we're going to do now is we're going to get one of those ARM templates and we're going to put it into a continuous uh, delivery pipeline, uh, as um, you know, as in a lot of the book. Uh, box, but also as we're going to demonstrate in, in team services. So here's our pipeline. Starting, oh, thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, somebody, oh, it's on no, the it's mine. I'll come over here. Okay. Yeah, hit the pen thing, though. All right, so we're going to start here. No, no. Go left. And do that. And then do 
Is that it? No, try that. And then at least uh, Pim, second one down. No. Yep. It's all right. Well, hey. User error. There we go. Cool. So we're going we're to start here. You've just seen this. Infrastructure as code, you know, the ability to be able to create uh, infrastructure out of code. Now I'm just going to do a little check in here and actually add a feature to our application. So we'll switch over to my VM, uh, sorry, to my, my book and we'll have a look at that. So here is Visual Studio Team Services. You would have seen this a few times now. Uh, this is our, yes, we've gone green, fantastic. So that was just in the nick of time. Uh, this when, is when was that build finished there? <laughs> uh, this, is our, this is our team services project. This is free. Anyone can create one of these for up to five users. It's a private repo at this stage. We will uh, publish, we will make um, our code public later on. Uh, but this is, here's the code. So let's go and have a look at what Callum was just talking about there. And he was showing you the parameters file and the JSON file. Here's that same JSON file. It's not the one he was working on, obviously, but here's a very similar thing inside Visual Studio Team Services, and I'm looking at it through the web editor now, right? So it's, I could do this in Visual Studio, but I can very quickly go in and have a look at that. Um, what I can also look at is the history. And I guess this, a lot of this talk is about uh, collaboration. And I just wanted to demonstrate that when we go and look at, look at the code and look at, uh, especially if I go into this area of the repo here, I can look at history. And what we're seeing here is collaboration, all right? It's not just, not just Cam doing the commits or myself doing the commits. We're actually seeing um, the, the history of those commits. I'll show you that one more time. That's the button I was looking for. Yeah, cool. Here we go. So we've been, we've been chipping away at this. Cam did a lot of work at the start. I came and, you know, have added bits and pieces, and this is really DevOps to me. Is if you've got a tool like this that's transparent, I can see the changes that Callum's made, he can see the changes that I made, I screwed it up at one point, he was able to go and blame it, see that I'd set the wrong priority on a firewall rule, you know, and, and vice versa. So, you know, really good collaboration there. Um, and in here, of course, we've got my, we've got the application code as well. So our app code is sitting right next to um, the infrastructure as code. So if I go into a controller, this is in my, this is in the API. I've got a little health controller here that reports on the health of, of this service. So, you know, I can point a load balancer at it and it'll report on its health. It just returns status is okay or, or whatever. It also returns a hard-coded version string there. This is just for the demo. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bump that version. So I'm going to push minor. And I just clicked edit there. So I'm editing in, in the browser. You would have seen this a hundred times already. And I'm just going to bump that version from 0.3 to 0.4. It's not a particularly um, significant enhancement, but I'm just making, making that change. Now, what I did then was I clicked save, and that's a commit. This is source control. So I've now committed that change with a comment saying this is what I changed, and also we'll see the, the history and the diff and that sort of thing. Now, what that's done is it has kicked off uh, this, this process here. Okay, so we've just, we've just kicked that off. No, that's your pin. Um, the kick this off here. It's continuous integration. As soon as I commit, and, or if, if Cam was to commit his instruction, then we've just kicked off another build. And it'll run some tests, and then out of that we'll get a package. So the cool thing about a package is it's like a zip file. It's like a, it's like a, um, it's like a collection of, of all the files and the, and the zip file all the files and, and the zip and that sort of thing that you need for, to deploy that application. So if you, do, if, you if you do deploy applications as an infrastructure person, then you'll be used to getting a drop folder or a zip file or something like that, and you go and you know, drop that into the bin folder or, or whatever you do. This is, the this is exactly the same thing. At the end of this build package, uh, build process, we will deploy a package. It's basically a zip file. It's got every single thing we need in it to successfully deploy the application. And, and if you've got one of those, you're winning, because then you can use a standard deployment process like web deploy, we're going to use Docker, things like that to go and deploy your code. So let's have a look and see what that, what that looks like. So if I go into build and release, go and have a look at my builds. So there's a really great CI hub inside VSTS. We can see our builds in progress because I just made that change. It was triggered 
um, by that guy. And this is running now, so it's, it's doing all of that. It only takes a few seconds. And I'll just jump in and we'll, we'll look at the, um, the edit part of this now. Oh, sorry, my bad. Sorry about that. Let me just uh, check the cameras. Right. Cool. So you would have seen this a few times. This is the build configuration, and down the left-hand side here, I've got a list of steps. This is the t deployment process, and we can configure this inside Team Services. So, I mean, who do you reckon would 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 own this and admin this in a, in a DevOps world? Can? It's a loaded question because we is. didn't have an answer about half an hour ago for this. Uh, about an hour ago. I think whoever's got the skills initially. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, to be perfectly honest, I found myself going more towards the dev world yeah. than the dev did towards the IT pro world. Yeah, so that absolutely. kind of indicates to me that probably the more dev oriented people would own the stuff initially. Sure. Yeah. But then there's also a good excuse to make the IT pros do it, right? Yeah. I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. I yeah. think you'd, you'd go into the team. But certainly the build part. As a developer, I should be really concerned in the, about the successful um, building of this code, right? So let's look at a couple of these steps. This one's just a good old-fashioned compile. This will go and compile the code, uh, which is you know C sharp, and out of that we'll get the DLLs and the bins and the other assets and things like that. Further down here, look at this. This is Node.js. This is doing the npm install into into a, a folder to go and get all of the dependencies I need for that for that Node app and put them into a folder where, where Docker can go and get them and, and build and run them. And then down here, this very last one, this is, this is the publish. So this is doing the actual publish into an artifacts folder or a drops, drop folder. So artifacts is a key concept in team services, just like Team City, just like Jenkins, where at the end of your build, you have a, you have a package. And these are the artifacts. So that's what we're doing um, with this step. Now, the cool thing about that is then we can take that and we can roll with it into the next stage, which is that deployment and the release process. So let's have a look at that. So, there's our release running. So that's interesting. So what happened was the build finished. It obviously was green, all the tests passed, compiled everything okay. Packaged it up and then now that's kicked off release 106 up the top there. That release 106 is basically a stamp. It's a cookie cut cutter of this release definition, which I can edit now. And similar story to what you just saw in, in the build view, where we've got environments on the left hand side we are, we are really deploying to dev test. Uh, we'll go to UAT and prod later. But we're going to dev test, and then we've got these tasks down the middle. Okay? Now, something happened just recently in team services that allows us to run a deployment on multiple agents. And that's very, very cool. Uh, and has actually made this demo possible. Um, so I'll just run through these first steps first. Okay? We've got an elastic cloud of build agents. So anyone who's, who's uh, been an admin of, of Team City or Team Services um, knows what it's like to maintain build agents. We're using the elastic ones in the cloud. They're called hosted agents. Um, they just spin up, do the thing, and then they, they disappear. So that's deploying the resource group. The resource group is pointing at the ARM template that Cam made out of the package and is actually creating that infrastructure from, from scratch. Now, then we switch agents. So we go to an actual, now we're going to an on-premises build agent or a build agent that's running on the VM. But here's the trick. We go and have a look at this diagram here. And remember we're talking about this. We want to create a Windows Server 2016 and we want to put two containers on it. Now the containers are run by the Docker service. And what we need right here is a little agent, is our build agent to actually go and do the Docker build and do the Docker run. So Docker build will build the containers and then run them. But the tricky part here is it's difficult or and sometimes not advisable to expose the Docker service to the internet so that our hosted agents can have them. In fact, in Windows, it's, it's very difficult to do that currently. So what we wanted to do was just to install a little agent here that it would actually do the Docker build and the Docker run on this actual box itself. And to do that, of course, we need to install an agent on the VM that we just created. Okay, so it's starting to feel like you know, those cranes that build themselves sort of thing because we've actually constructed mm. the VM from scratch. It's kind of the, the doozers in Fraggle Rock. They're actually building the, 
the VM and then they go and install the, the build agent on it, which then goes and does the rest of the job. And that's, that's what's going on here. Docker Run is just a couple of lines of PowerShell that's doing those commands, if you know Docker. Um, on a Windows Server container, by the way, and then is, is doing the Docker work. And then we switch back to a hosted agent to actually run some tests. So for this part, and this is, I really like this from an infrastructure point of view, we're using Pesta. So Pesta shipped in Windows Server 2016. It's open source. Our first bit of software that's open source that comes with Amazing that we've shipped apparently, yeah. Yep, it's like two years old. And it's, uh, it's, we're shipping it in Windows Server 2016. <laughs> and with Pesta, you can run PowerShell tests, okay? So you write your tests in PowerShell. So we'll show you what that looks like. Uh, let's go and find a file here. Here they are. So I've, this is my scripts folder. This is where my PowerShell is. Uh, this one's called uh, smoke.test. Now smoke is that old term, you know, you turn on the machine, if smoke comes out, then, then the test fails, right? Uh, the modern term for that is post-release verification test, but I, I still like smoke. Yeah. Um, so I call it smoke test. Now have a look at this. This is all PowerShell, by the way. This is what Pesta gets you in PowerShell 5, or you can uh, install it into PowerShell 4. Once API is being deployed, responds with a uh, response with health status OK. So remember that health endpoint will respond OK. I get the response. So I'm doing invoke rest method. Anyone who's done PowerShell knows invoke, invoke rest method. I do a get on the endpoint, I get the response, and then I go and look in that response, and then you get this nifty little syntax here that says response status should be OK. That's the assert. If that fails, fails the PowerShell, fails the build, uh, sorry, fails the release. And then we get a report saying, well, you might have deployed that API, but it's not actually up and running. And that's crucial, right? I mean, how many times have we done a release and someone's forgot to turn on the fax service or, or someone's forgot to start up, you know, service XYZ. So you can now start going and writing all of these tests into your release process so that you can actually assert that, that the things you are deploying are up and running. So, yeah, really powerful technique. Have we got time for, for one more? One more what? One more trick. Yes. Okay. I don't know. You've got the, this time it wasn't started, so. It's... Uh, Five minutes later, I think we're good. All right. Yeah. So I'll show you one more trick before we, we go and have a look at something else very cool. So we go into releases. We've done our release configuration, and Cam and I have sweated over this for how long? This demo? Yeah. Honestly? <coughs> a couple of months. A couple of months to get to this point, to get to dev test. And, you know, that's hours and hours of figuring all this stuff out, getting it to work and that sort of thing. But we got to dev test, so yay. We've shipped, that release will go, will go green, and we're good. Now, should we go to UAT? Yes. So the realistic, more realistic scenario is once you've, gone to UA, once you've gone to test, you want to go to UAT, and then, of course, after that, you want to go to prod. But you can't just ship straight to UAT, or well, most organizations can't. You need some sort of change, control, or approvals process in the middle. So let's just see what that looks like. So what we can do is we can clone this environment. So it took us, what? You know, it's 40 hours or four weeks or months or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, let's see how long it takes us to build UAT. So first of all, I'll set up my approvers. Cam, you love change control, don't you? I do. Oh, it really makes me happy. You're all over it. All right. So I'll put you in as my change control committee uh, head. And what, what this is doing is it's saying send an email to Cam when the dev test uh, deployment succeeds and ask him when it's okay to, to deploy that same build to UAT. So I click Create, and that's exactly what will happen. And now I double click, I'll just rename this to UAT. Cool, and you can stop this time, the stopwatch, how long was that? Because that's UAT, we run that build, it takes about 15 minutes, yeah. and that will now take that exact same, stamp out that exact same infrastructure, and deploy that version, that package of the infrastructure, onto UAT, and obviously the next step's um, prod as well. Uh, so, yeah, very cool, mm. very powerful. Um, that's called release management inside the STS. Awesome. So, that should be back to me. A little bit of luck. Awesome. Groovy. So, we're now at the point that we had a look at our ARM templates. We've built our environment. Now we want to start configuring it, the post-build, build-run checklist stuff. So, what we, we want to use DSC, which is really cool. DC is a great thing. I didn't want to have to do an on-premise build thing, so we decided to look at using Azure Automation DSC. And that's what we're going to have a look at now. So what we do, we go into our Azure portal, which is nice and tidy, 
And we can see we've got an uh, automation accounts in here. This is how we get into Azure Automation. You go and add yourself an account, which is just another container, another collection really, and we've got one pre-populated. Once you come in and here, you can have a look at the information that's inside. Now, Neil Pearson, I think, showed this stuff this morning. Fortunately, he didn't show the DSC stuff, because otherwise I would have been a bit upset. But the DSC stuff in here is baked in. So pretty much, DSC is a game of two halves, right? You've got the back-end stuff, the server bit, and then you've got the agents, or the nodes as they're called. So what we decided to do was a couple of needs had boiled up. So what I want to do is I want to go into the DSC configurations, and ultimately what I'm going to do is just simply add one in. Now when you add one in, you just go and specify a PowerShell file. It's just a PS1. It's got to be less than a meg, I think, in size, but oh, here you go, less than a meg to import. There you go. So that's cool. So we need a DSC file. Now, I've got my one here, and again, there's awesome articles out there on the internet. You get a whole bunch of pre-built stuff, uh, and there's a couple extra modules you can load up. So, when I started, uh, one of the requirements I had was to do an environment mm. variable, right? So that was cool. You can go and have one of the default types. You have resources. to zoom that. Oh, yeah, sorry, mate. There we go. So we had to create an environment variable. So this is PowerShell? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yep. Dead easy. We go and find the thing we need, the internet. We declare its environment, and we've got a little syntax to follow. Great, so that's the environment variable that I needed to Absolutely. get Docker working. The next one we needed to do was you needed a file and a directory. So that was cool. There's not one that did exactly what we wanted, so we decided to try and call a bit of PowerShell. So we used the script facility. And all you need to do there, the guts of it, is the test and set. So I had a look to see, does this particular file exist? If it does, then that's cool. Oh, I didn't check to see what was in it. Whoops. I just took it at face value. So if the file exists, I don't do anything. If the file doesn't exist, then I go and create it. Oh, I, I didn't content check it. Sweet. Oh, well. Next, Next version. version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's cool. So we need to create the file. So we just go and do a little bit of one line PowerShell on there. I mean, basically copy con or typing something out to a file in PowerShell. So that was groovy. We then decided that we need to do uh, change the local firewall on the box. You can't do that with the default stuff. So we had to go and load up a module. So you just go find the module you need from GitHub, you can load it into Azure Automation, and then you can go and use it. Are there lots of modules, Cam? I'm, I'm genuine question of, I haven't looked at this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's tons. So module for everything? Ooh, yeah. Many things. Okay. So um, we're writing them, other people are writing them. Right. They're all over the show. Cool. So chances are, unless you're doing something particularly exotic, you probably have a module already done for you. Right. It's just a case of finding it. Uh, and GitHub's your friend. Mm. That's just awesome. There's just so much stuff there. So we went through. So that was cool. So I went in, created this file, and I imported it into... Oh, that's too hard to read like that. I imported it into DSC, which is nice and tidy and easy. Once the file's been imported, you then need to compile it. Now, you can do all of this stuff in the command line as well. It's a little bit more involved, maybe, maybe fiddly, but it's certainly possible from the power line with PowerShell, right? I wanted to use a GUI because it's just a whole bunch easier. So now I've set up the back-end stuff. I've created my file, I've uploaded it, I've compiled it, and it's ready to be used. We can now go and get our nodes to refer to that thing. Now, because we've set the stuff up in Azure Automation, we've basically set up a pool server here. We just need to make the nodes talk to it. So what I wanted to do was when we did the ARM template to build the environment that, that the app's got on top of, I wanted to bake in the agent builds into my ARM template. So pretty much my ARM template builds a server, um, commissions a, a zero SQL DB, not pad SQL as we say, and I baked in four agents. One for OMS, one for the VM agent itself, uh, the DSC extension, and something else which eludes me right now. So I baked those agents into it, which is really nice and tidy and nice and easy. So when, oh, I, should show you, I should show you that actually. So when the environment's built, it automatically connects in. Now I'm going to have to go and open up my stuff. How much time we got, Dan? We're good. Are we cool? Yeah. Ten minutes. Oh, great. Okay, we'll just quickly show it then. Groovy. So here's my template. 
So it started getting a bit big, to be honest, by this point. Uh, and one of the things we'd like to do in the next version is maybe split it out a little bit. Um, I think we could be a bit more modular in what we do. But like any of these things, how you do it the first time is not how you're going to do it the second time. You're always learning on the job. If we scroll down the bottom, we can have a look. Have I got my desk? Yeah, I've got to find it first. Oh, there we go, it's right in front of me. Cool. So, here we go. And here's some of the DSC stuff starting in. So I right, come up to, yeah, there we go. So the VSC, the VM extension for DSC, which is really cool. You come down, you've got your API version. Most of the stuff you can just find out there. Uh, I'll show you the web page in a second, which gives you all the information. And by and large, I think I actually just used what was off of uh, Zero Quick Start Templates memory and took it across. All we needed to really do was specify the parameters which specified our configuration name. And that was about it. So we've got the stuff baked into the untemplate, we poke the configuration name in. When this goes through, it picks it up and it applies it on the boxes. So now every time Dan does a build, it's automatically applied. So the, the VMs are nodes that are registering? Yep. Cool. Yep. That's and awesome. if you have a look, <laughs> uh -huh. If we have a look in here, and I'll zoom that in a second probably. Oh, you can kind of see the point. The, if you have a look, you can see all our lab attempts in here. We've got all sorts of junk left over. We didn't get a chance to clean it up. Oh, there we go. I've got children. <laughs> Jiggly puffs. Yeah, yeah. Unresponsive. Yeah, and apparently there's good Pokemon here as well. But anyway, so, so these all self-register in here. Cool. And then you can check their compliance, and you can have a look. And we can see that every 15, oh, two on that one. every 15 minutes, we just make sure that whatever Dan wants on those boxes is put back in place. And we tested it, and we started deleting files, and they get recreated, and all that sort of stuff. So your servers are automatically done, and there's no drift. Awesome. So that's the DSC thing. The other thing we wanted to do as well was the monitoring, which is a passion of mine. I come from a monitoring background, and we want to use OMS. All right, so I should backtrack, actually. By default, when we build the VMs, we've got a zero monitor. Now, this turned up about a week and a half ago. It was a bit of a surprise to myself, because all of a sudden, we had a monitoring thing there. Okay. What this will do is, a whole bunch of nice default stuff for you. It can go and monitor all the activity on your subscription, which is kind of nice. It keeps it across things, what's changing, and so on. But the thing that I wanted it for was just the metrics. I just wanted to keep it simple. So let's go look at demo two. I'm hoping it still exists. Cool, groovy. We might be on demo three right now. Yeah, I just um, <laughs> <laughs> surprise. All right, so we've got a couple of base metrics, nothing heavy, but you can see that we start getting a really unused server, which probably means I'm paying too much for it, to be honest. Um, really basic metrics, nothing heavy. Um, all we want to do is the basic stuff. If you want more, you can turn on diagnostics, and you start getting a ton of information. You start getting .NET things and all that sort of stuff. Um, I didn't turn it on here, because it can take a second or two to load, and I didn't want to demo that. Yeah, but if you were going to do it, I'd probably be quite smart and pick out metrics which actually relate to what you're doing. Yeah. I think scattergun monitoring is a bit stupid. Did demo threes show up? Oh, well, we can have a look. That's the one we just did. Yeah, but when you say just, it's like, how old? Can I hit that endpoint? Oh, there you go. So what do we go? There we go. Oh, there you go. That proves so it works, doesn't it? So that's the app that we just deployed. Alrighty, so that's cool. So that's our base metrics. Glad to see it came through for you. The other thing we wanted to do was OMS as well. And we used OMS for some niche monitoring, right? Where do I put it? Up here. So OMS is awesome. All we did was set up a workspace ahead of time, and we put the solution packs in. So with OMS, you set up your workspace, you pick your solution packs for the type of things you want to monitor, and then that's all you do there. And you connect the agents in, which is nice and tidy. Very cool. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, I'm guessing. So, the main thing that I wanted to play with was we've got an Azure SQL database in there. 
it's PaaS, Platform as a Service. I just wanted to make sure we had some metrics for the thing. So it turns out, good old idea, gets released and stuff every three weeks. This got released or maybe three weeks ago as well. So we can now use OMS to do the SQL monitoring for the PaaS, which is really cool. Now there's barely anything in our system and it's barely doing anything, but that's cool. As we scale it out or scale it up, I've got that monitoring baked in, which is what I'm really keen on. I'm not gonna go into these things in detail now. I wanna keep track of my logs, particularly my security logs, particularly people trying to do bad things to my system. I wanna keep track of patches that I'm missing so that I can put them on the beast. And the idea was to do the container monitoring here as well, but unfortunately I don't think it quite works in the way we wanted it to. But I put it there as a placeholder for the future because it might come through. We probably didn't get that far in our research to be fair, but I have seen some, some agents mm. for that. But yeah. yeah, that's the thing. We, it's moving so quickly. Yeah, it is. And if you're not careful, you try to boil the ocean for your demo. So we're just trying to keep it simple. All right, so I think we should probably jump back to the PowerPoint there. Yeah, great. Get a bit Can of I just on? quickly show off the, the deployed app? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to um, just to prove that we did actually deploy something just then. So if you if you remember, we bumped that version number to 1.0.4. So there's that health endpoint. It's uh, forward slash API forward slash health on port 5000. That's the that's the VM that we dynamically uh, deployed to. So provisioned and, and deployed to it. At, at that time. There's also just a hello world, that's the HTML um, endpoint. So yeah, uh, that release ran uh, just in the background while we, while we were talking there. Nice. Thank you. All right, six of these. Oh, actually, outcomes. Outcomes. Quickly. So that's pretty much the end of our talk. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions, um, I, I believe, but we just really wanted to go over again, just a bit of a recap in terms of where we see see those, you know, those great outcomes for DevOps culture. And, and we've, we sort of split our talk into two parts. One's about the culture, the other part's clearly about the tools and the processes and the things that you can do. Hopefully you'll see what we've demonstrated is transferable. It can transfer onto on-premises, you know, other server versions, you know, um, into Azure, however you want to, to use it. But what we're really driving towards, and I think our favorite outcomes out of all this are the, the shorter cycle times. How quickly can we get value to customers and users? How, how can we get a shared understanding of compliance and risk? There's another great thing you, you just skipped over there, the activity logs. The activity yeah. log is the activity of every single change that's been made to that environment. And you can also show changes inside the VMs as well. So that's ticketing, ticking a couple of audit boxes there for, for compliance. Um, and what we're really driving towards, of course, is reliable, low-risk releases. You know, we shouldn't have to be staying awake at night either worrying about a release or, or responding to it when it goes wrong. So um, yeah, we really, those are our favorite outcomes that, that we like out of a, a DevOps culture. Groovy. Right, last slide. We just wanted to give you some information to go away with. Uh, for the IT pros out there, of this stuff, oh, for the DevOps, for the developers as well. It's the beginning of a journey and it's really handy to get some getting started information. It's all freely available. Uh, it's just kind of my notes, frankly, that I got as I went through. I'm pretty sure the slide deck will be made available. Yes, absolutely. If um, it's not, they can always ping Dan or I. Yep. It's just our names at the beginning of the thing. You can just ping us. I'm just Callum Delar at Microsoft.com. You're Daniel Larson? Mine's a bit weird. It's Delars at Microsoft.com, which is a bit embarrassing. But you can tweet me at uh, Daniel Larson NZ. Um, and yeah, if you want source code, we're happy to share that. We'll, at some stage, we'll put it on a public repo, probably GitHub. Um, so yeah, just let us know if there's anything you want, if you have any, any questions at all. I think we've got time for a couple of questions now, actually. If anyone would like to ask one. Yes, sir. No testing for the infrastructure specifically? As code, okay, cool. So the question was, You've got your, your build pipeline up on the screen. Can we do you want me to bring it up? up? Oh, you got your build pipeline up on the screen. You're doing infrastructure as code. How do you get test um, testing of infrastructure into that pipeline? Is that generally the gist? Well, there's a couple of testing points in this pipeline, and you really choose. So the one we the one we demonstrated was just after release here. So once we'd released, we'd wanted we wanted to actually test that the API was up and running. Now, of course, because the API was dependent on the infrastructure. 
then obviously that needs to be working for, for that test to pass. However, if you wanted to be more, more specific about the infrastructure itself, then you've got options. So DSE will test itself. So you, when you write those DSE functions, you can see they do a test. Now, if you write those carefully, DSE will actually do its own tests. And I think some of those, don't quote me on this, I'm not a DSE guy, but I think some of those are PESTA runnable. And the other part is you can then make specific, you can query the resource group. It's all an API. So you can go and query the resource group using Azure PowerShell check and you can make specific inquiries into the resource group and say, for example, is my subnet a, a slash 8 or is it a slash 24? Um, that sort of stuff. Does that answer your, your question? Yeah, cool. Great question. Uh, probably got time for one more. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Continuous Delivery is, is the name of the book. It's by Jez Humble and the guy Farley. Can anyone remember the, Farley's first name? Dave, yeah? He's Dave the guy Farley. we keep forgetting. Thanks, Joe knows it, Dave Farley, yeah. Awesome. Anything else? Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Awesome. Thank you.